My name is my name is Katie Locke. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications here at the Gardner Institute, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you back um, to this series. For those of you who have participated before, this is a continuation of a series we started in the spring as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And, um, and it morphed into a, a lot of interesting conversations about topical issues in higher education. And it was so popular that we decided we will um, we would continue it. So uh, Dr. Flippin Wynn from the Gardner Institute will be your hostess with the mostest today. And um, I will let her introduce her panelist. But I'd like to start by first introducing um, Dr. Drew Koch, who is the President and Chief Operating Officer here at the Gardner Institute. Um, he's going to welcome us and get us started today. Um, before you do, Drew, sorry, um, I forgot to mention that this is being recorded. We will share the recording with all registered participants. We have, will have this recording and the recordings of all our past series available on our webpage. We do want to make this interactive, so please utilize the question and answer function. And if you would like to ask a question live, raise your hand. So now I will introduce Dr. Koch. Thank you, Drew. Katie, thank you, and uh, good afternoon or morning, colleagues, depending on where you are. It's a real pleasure to have you with us right now. Um, as Katie mentioned, uh, we started these uh, really weekly conversations, if you will, um, in, the, uh, in the advent, the early stages of uh, the coronavirus. And uh, the drop-in conversations that we were doing that, that become to be known as forums, if you will, really started as uh, one of five commitments that the Gardner Institute made to uh, both the institutions that it was working with and um, the broader higher ed community of which those institutions were a part. In fact, this was one of the five where uh, we wanted to make sure that we were providing weekly, if not bi-weekly opportunities for institutions to hear from one another uh, and uh, from experts in the field about how they were adjusting and adapting to the circumstances surrounding the novel coronavirus and the, the disease associated with COVID-19. Um, Katie also mentioned that um, uh, they were so popular. In fact, we had, I believe, somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,500 new friends register across the series. Uh, they, were, they were so popular that uh, we decided uh, that uh, we take a little bit of a hiatus, adjust and adapt, and then come forward with what we're now calling uh, the transformative conversations. Uh, and these conversations are attended, intended to help, uh, again, the broader higher ed community, of which you're all part, uh, focus on the transformations necessary for the fall term and beyond. Uh, there are elements that are tied to uh, the novel coronavirus. There are other elements that are tied to just unjust systems and unjust design that uh, all colleges and universities should be focusing on and working towards uh, redesigning. That brings us back to uh, why we're here, right? An existential statement on some level and another level, um, uh, really a, a very, very meaningful uh, element that we need to explore. And that's simply this. The Institute itself is here to help colleges and universities and post-secondary educators improve teaching and learning, student success, and in the process of doing so, advance broader goals associated with equity and social justice. We're doing these series under the leadership of Dr. Flip and Wynn, because this very much so is about our uh, our equity and social justice mission. And because it allows a broader group of persons, some of whom have never worked with or previously heard of the Gardner Institute, uh, to be connecting through and with us uh, with the broader higher ed community. So it's with uh, that backdrop that I uh, will end as I started and really share that it's a true honor to have you all with us in this, the inaugural discussion of the new Transformative Conversation series. And who better than to take it from here out but the person who has been steering and guiding its development all along, uh, Dr. Monica Flippin Wynn. So Monica, I cede the mic and the uh, Zoom platform to you. 
Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Koch. Thanks for coming in and, and getting us started today. Also, I want to just initially thank uh, Katie, Rob, and Ethan, whom without, I would be uh, sitting here by myself uh, today. So thank you again for starting the journey with us. We've got an amazing uh, forum to start off uh, today, and we've got quite a few after this to put us in the idea of where we're going uh, from COVID. Uh, and so with no further ado, because I want to use up all our time, I'd like to introduce our guests and what we heard from you last uh, during our initial uh, forums is that uh, the attendees love it when we have uh, students. And so we're going to really work hard uh, to have a student on most of our forums to give that perspective, which is so important to how we move forward. Uh, so we have with us uh, Dr. Laura Lynch. Hi, Dr. Lynch, how are you today? She's the Assistant Vice President for Faculty Affairs and Professor at the College of Coastal Georgia. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm excited to be here. We're glad to have you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have uh, Dr. Natalie Tindall. Uh, Dr. Tindall is the, the Department Chair and uh, Associate Professor uh, in the Department of Communi Communication and Media at Lamar University. How you doing, Dr. Tindall? Great, glad to be here. Good, glad to have you. And last but not least, we have Carrie Wilson, who is a student at the University of North Carolina, Asheville. Carrie, how are you? Hi, good, how are you? Very good, glad to have you here. Glad so, to be here. Very good. What we have next is what we've done uh, before is that we have all of our guests make a brief statement. After they make a statement, and it could be on how their institution is working uh, to transform, or maybe there's one lesson that they learned that you know is taking them out of the water. And then after that, we ask for the attendees in the forum uh, to provide us questions. So we'll start with Dr. Lynch, we'll go to Dr. Tindo, and then Carrie will uh, end us with the statements and then we'll take questions. Dr. Lynch? So uh, I am at a small college, which means that I wear a lot of different hats. Uh, so I just wanted to let you know some of the major areas that I've been involved with. So uh, everyone has an idea of, of what I might be able to address, but uh, I've been over course scheduling, curriculum, faculty development, our office of e-learning, and I'm one of the G2C liaisons. Um, a lesson learned. One of the things that we did in spring that uh, had a great um, outcome for us was uh, to survey all of our students as soon as we transitioned to online classes to learn what their access was to technology. Did they have a computer? If they didn't, did they at least have a tablet or a smartphone? Um, did they have internet? If not, did they have uh, data on their phone? And then we provided the answers to that survey for every student on the class rosters we give to our faculty and the faculty had those answers. And that really allowed us to meet the students where they were at and help to really address uh, equity issues with students who maybe didn't have the same resources and get laptops to students who didn't have them. So, yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Tindo. Okay, well, again, thank you so much. Um, I was reading a I was reading um, a blog today, and it was talking about the unknowable future. And they talked about this whole period of time being very different from running any type of race. If you've ever run a 5K or walked or run a um, half marathon, you know what the distance is going to be. Now we're in a race when we don't know what the distance is going to be, and so it's been a continual journey and trying to figure out what we can do. And we're stuck in the not knowing of what's going to happen, but we have to plan something. So for me, this whole process has been dealing with the sudden obliteration of expectation. Um, we, the fall semester is going to be unlike anything we've ever seen, but what can we do? How can we move forward? And some of the things that I've done is try to, as a department chair, um, create 
um, clarity out of confusion. Um, sometimes faculty are getting mixed messages at my institution. So making sure we get down and drill down to what exactly do we need to do? How do we need to deploy this? Um, also, I went to the serenity prayer and one of the things that I can't control and one of the things that are outside of my control. I can control working with my faculty to help get them online, working to get them um, prepared for a fall that is probably going to be online even though people in my state don't believe it's going to be online. Um, and also working with students and making sure our students understand that we have their best interest at heart and we're working with them. And I will say too, another thing that we have done is seriously thinking of contingency plans. So plan A, plan B, plan C, and working through those. Um, I met with my faculty, or some of my faculty earlier today, and they were just happy to say that our department has done things that other departments aren't doing. And that really is because um, I've been, as a chair, looking to see what other universities are doing, looking to see what's happening in the science literature and what the best recommendations are and really trying to make good decisions based on knowing who our faculty are, knowing who our students are, and knowing what we need to do to best suit our students and their needs, and also making sure we're doing the right thing scientifically. So for me, that's been the process. Again, it's this uh, the unknown knowns that are out there. I can't control those, but the things that I can control, let's go ahead and try and do those and make that give up give ourselves a pathway for the future okay all right thanks a lot carrie hi uh my name is carrie wilson i'm a rising senior at the university of north carolina at Asheville. it's the public university it's a public liberal arts university in our state and i am majoring in mass communications and minoring in sociology i am the social media editor of our school paper and um, I, I'm also hard of hearing. So it's been, I've been having to um, really reach out to my professors and advocate for myself to make sure I have the same access as everyone else during like these transitional times. And I'm concerned about going back to class in person in the fall. Uh, all my classes are, so, are going to be meeting in person at least somewhat. And that's concerning. But um, I know everyone's just doing their best. Okay. Well, thank you, Carrie. Um, I'm going to probably f uh, go back to that in just a minute. Do we have any uh, questions right now, uh, Katie? Looks like we've Sorry. Got Let me see if I can unmute myself. Um, we do. It says, how do we, as instructors, who are still going to have face-to-face -face class help our students feel safe when they might not be? That's an excellent question and I actually think everybody can answer that. Uh, our two administrators and, uh, and teachers, but also Carrie can talk about what's uh, making her feel uh, uncomfortable about going back. So uh, Dr. Lynch, why don't you start us off? Yeah, one of the big things is just communication. Uh, making sure students know what your school is doing. And this is something that um, at my institution we're working on to finalize right now, our communication to our students. But what is your institution doing to ensure students and uh, everyone on campus will be safe? Um, what happens, letting everyone know what happens if somebody in the class, for example, um, tests positive. So that way they are prepared ahead of time of what to expect. Um, and, and then I think a really big uh, part and one thing that we're going to focus on with some faculty development this semester is that human element, just making sure that your students know that, um, that you care for them, especially if you're teaching online courses. Uh, it's, it's a little bit more of a stretch for students because they don't necessarily see you as a person uh, to, to find those ways to really in, uh, infuse the human element throughout your course. Okay, uh, Dr. Tindo? Um. I think honesty and transparency going along with the communication is definitely important. Um, students are getting a lot of mixed messages from various components. 
um, from the media, from their family, from their friends, what they're reading on the university website. So how do we cut through that clutter and actually direct, give them what's going to happen in this class, what is going to be the best strategy? I also think too that as professors in classrooms that are face-to-face, what is the learning strategy going to be and have you explain that to the students? Are you doing high flex? Are you doing hybrid? Are you, are you making provisions for those who don't feel comfortable coming to class? All of those things make a difference and some universities and some administrators are covering for faculty and telling faculty and letting them be empowered to make those decisions in classrooms. Other places are dictating what needs to be done. Depending on your situation, being honest and transparent with your students as well as to say the university is requiring that we do this or this is what the university says this is how we're going to operate in my class and really being personal um in in crisis communication one of the strategies that i've studied is you know we have the the leader has to be in the same boat with everybody else the leader has to say I'm in this with you. I'm under, I'm having some of the same issues, but we are going to get through this together. That type of thinking, that type of, of speaking and strategy will help as well with students. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, Carrie, we had a question to ask. You mentioned uh, you were a little nervous about going back to face-to-face. Uh, uh, -to -face. Did the administration ask you specifically about uh, what you wanted to do uh, for fall 2020? They did not. Um, some of the classes are hy hybrid, some have moved all online, and some are all in person. And I haven't seen the university ask. I'm one of the students that checks their email regularly, even during the summer. I know a lot of students just don't check their emails often, <laughs> and, but the um, school hasn't asked me. As uh, the social media editor of our paper, we did a Facebook poll and an Instagram story poll to see what people were thinking. And most people on Instagram, uh, it wasn't a huge margin, but most people said they felt comfortable. And on Facebook, most people said they didn't feel comfortable going to class. So it's not like, a scientifically backed poll, but it's what we have. <laughs> it's what you have. Okay, and, and if I could just continue on that, what is it that makes you uh, uncomfortable about going back to classes? Um, except, let me, except for the pandemic. Uh, <laughs> what, what is I, it that, yeah. I, um, everyone's going to be in classes, in different classes, interacting with different people in all their classes. So if you have, we're a small school, we have less, we have like 4,000 students, I believe. But let's say there's 30 people in one of your classes, 30 people in another class, 30 people in another class. You're interacting with over 100 different people and everyone else in your class is probably also interacting with over 100 different people. So one of those 100 people might have coronavirus. And I don't think that wearing ma masks are great, even if they make um, accessibility harder for me because I it muscles speech and I rely on lip reading as well. But masks are so important. But what about when someone's thirsty? What about those morning classes where everyone's trying to chug their coffee? How's that going to work? Okay, so, so you've not been given any kind of direction as to how they're going to handle the spacing or et cetera? Yeah, okay. I haven't. Okay, and Dr. Uh, Dr. Tyndall, has your university provided that uh, for uh, your faculty and staff, or are you going to be totally online? We are, we're doing a mix of online, hybrid, hybrid flex, and face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. um, I moved the majority of our department's classes hybrid because we have a robust online program and that was an easy shift for us. But we are now getting information on here's the reduced classroom capacity and when you have a classroom that normally seats 80 people and you can only fit 15 in here how exactly does that change the tenor of the class and also the operations of the class if you only meet on tuesday nights so we, it's a lot of juggling that everybody's getting ready to do and again bringing up carrie's point we just talked about this as a faculty so if somebody is exposed to COVID, do we all go in 
to quarantine? How does that work? Do I mean so working through those types of things and getting into the weeds that that is where we're hitting a lot of snags and just a lot of uh, there's a lot of clarity. We just know that oh, okay, if somebody has COVID, they need to report it. But what about the other moving parts? Because there are going to be a hundred people that possibly may be exposed, and how does that work out? And for your classes, um, it's it's as I've told many people, it's like nailing jello to a wall. It's very, very difficult to figure out what, we know that this is happening, but we just don't have a lot of information about the other steps in the process right now. Okay, uh, and Dr. Lynch, are you uh, on online fully or are you doing kind of a mix also? All institutions in the University System of Georgia are face-to-face, -face, but there is a mix. So at College of Coastal Georgia for fall, um, we're still making some changes, but right now we're at 40% of our classes are online for the fall, 30% uh, roughly are hybrid, and 30% are online. And I just want to say I was so glad to hear uh, what Carrie had to say. I just jotted down a note of something to change in our, uh, to add to our communication plan, which is our class size in in those face-to-face uh, -face and hybrid classes um, what what we're doing is we're having to reduce class size um, generally we would have a math class for example uh, 30 students meet Tuesdays and Thursdays. Now what we're doing is we're meeting 15 of those students on Tuesday and 15 of those students on Thursday. So the students aren't going to be around as many people at a time as they normally are. So I'm going to do a quick calculation after this of our, or what our average class size is going to look and, and add that in. <laughs> and I'll, I'll say this, um, Austin Community College actually has an excellent video on YouTube that explains all their procedures, including distance, class size, and things like that. And I'm on my university's communication committee. Um, and so that is one thing I've passed along. I said, this is a really good example for students so they understand when you come in, you're going to get your temperature read. There are certain things that are going to happen as you pro progress through the day. So um, there's great examples of that messaging too, Dr. Lynch, if you want to take that um, back to your committee as well, or back to you. Okay, and that's the wonderful uh, thing about the forum is that we build off of each other's ideas and questions and, and so uh, everybody helps everybody else and in, in the end, uh, all the students uh, will benefit from them. So thank you very much for the collaboration. Looks like we've got a question, Katie. We do, Monica. Um, the question is, so there were no protocols established or being established for the re return to school at your institution. At Coma Community College, we, the leadership team, have published safe return campus booklets and posted them online for our students to know what is expected when we return. Um, <laughs> so I guess she's asking, was there, were there no protocols established? And I'm not sure Rose, if you want to put in the chat who that question was specifically addressed to. Or I guess we can we can rephrase the question, are there any protocols established or being established for the return to school at your institutions? Uh, she was asking that specifically for Carrie. Okay. So um, there are, I don't have the protocols memorized, but I did read them briefly because it, they sent it in like a 60 page PDF. Um, I like read through it and it says they're going to have separate dorms for students who have been exposed or have coronavirus. And um, they're going to try to distance people. They're having students move in at different times um, and not everyone moving in on the same day. But um, there are protocols in place, but I don't know if they'll be enough, if it's enough. Okay. Uh, and, and, that's a, and that's an honest, transparent answer, isn't it, Carrie? Yeah, <laughs> I'm not representing the administration here. So. <laughs> but you're representing yourself and that's enough and you're saying it doesn't think it, it's gonna be enough. Uh, do we have another yeah. question? Okay, okay. Um, care, uh, Katie? Yeah, we have another question. Um, 
So um, with for the administrators, with the reduced class sizes and the sort of hybrid and online, what about those seniors who are looking for specific classes for graduations, like Carrie is? Um, if their classes, if they need classes to be online and they're face to face or whatever, how are you addressing that? I, as a senior, I don't know if this was directed towards me, but I have to take a law class in the, I want to take it in the fall because it's a hard class and I don't want to take it my last semester. And it's only offered, uh, there's only one like time it's taught this fall with like one professor and I have to go in person twice a week for it. And I reached out to my professor to see if I could do it all online. And uh, she said, no, uh, you have to like come in person. I like tried to see about that, but I have to, I'm going to have to take that class in person in the fall and mm -hmm. also online, but. Yeah, if you get it, maybe it were a high flex opportunity uh, where you could go if you wanted to or not want to go. Okay, uh, yeah. Dr. Lynch, Dr. Tindo, uh, response to that question? Um, for my, I'm sorry, Dr. Lynch, I apologize. No, go right ahead. Um, I, when we were talking about the fall, I went ahead and made the decision to have all of our classes hybrid um, for the simple fact that gives the instructors the flexibility also to our instructors are working with students. Um, again, we are a smaller department. We only have about two, 275 students. So we are working individually with um, students and trying to see what they need, what, what type of um, accommodations we, can, we, we need to make for them. Um, and again, at my university, we have a lot of non-traditional students. So I have students who are essential workers. I have students who have um, middle school and high school age children. I have students who are working in the plants here, the, in the oil and energy field and are working night shifts. So we again have always had to accommodate and sort of shift for our students. So this is not uncommon for us, but I think the demand now for so many students who have immunocompromised systems or are living with family members who have those type who are who are not able to 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 come to class not able to and willing to be on campus we're seeing a higher demand and of course we're just trying to meet it in any way we can and i've asked my faculty and i i hate to use the word empowerment but i've told them let's do the best we can for our students especially those that are trying to graduate and um need these classes but may not be able to do a fully online, I mean, a fully face-to-face -face class. So hybrid flex, hybrid one-on-one -on -one independent studies, deal, adding some little things in there to make sure that the students can get what they need from the classes. Okay, okay. Uh, Dr. Lynch? So we are not planning on using the high flex model for any uh, classes for the entirety of the semester. There may be situations uh, that occur in the middle of a semester where we may adopt that for a brief period of time. But um, as a small college, uh, we generally have only one section available of our uh, senior level, upper level classes, much like uh, Carrie's experience uh, is. So for the gen ed course, Courses, students can generally choose whether they want face-to-face -face, hybrid online uh, but for our senior level classes they're uh, they're either they're gonna have to select the option that's available to them uh, if something happens to a student in the middle of the semester and they say need to quarantine then we are uh, working with faculty to um, in our um, syllabi and things have policies that are very flexible in these situations. Uh, also, uh, several of our departments are looking at trying to use more of a flipped classroom model. So that way, if students uh, can't come to class at, at periods of time, then they'll still get that content uh, that, that they need in order su to succeed throughout the semester. Okay, thank you very much. And, and I think we we give kudos to our wonderful faculty uh, at all of our universities and colleges who have pivoted and done so many things and uh, worked towards understanding and listening uh, and bringing uh, uh, our students doing the very best that they can uh, with the resources. So uh, I wanna thank you for, uh, for doing all of that. Uh, Katie, we got another question? They're flowing in now, Monica. We got quite a few. 
<laughs> so at your institutions, does these instructors have the autonomy to dismiss a non-mask compliant student from the class to maintain the safety of the other students? I think that's a hot topic. The hot topic. Uh, uh, Dr. Chendo? Um, no, we do not have the authority to do that. We are told, we were told, I'm in Texas and as a Texas state um, institution, we, I was informed that we do not have the right to um, tell a student that they cannot be in the class if they do not wear a mask. Um, however, there are orders um, in, in counties um, from the governor that if you have more than a certain number of corona cases right now, you need to wear a mask in businesses. Um, the information, again, it's a mixed message. On one hand, I've heard from the campus that we cannot. On another hand, I've heard that we can. So um, no one knows at this moment in time. Um, and that is a very real concern for my faculty and for my students as well. So uh, we can't use the police to enforce this either because that means they'll be responding to this type of issue almost every single hour. I, it, no one knows, and at least for us. Okay, okay, Dr. Lynch? Uh, yes, for us. So the University System of Georgia, which we are a part of, is requiring masks for students in classroom buildings, in buildings in general, not just classroom buildings. And so um, we have a uniform syllabus template that we use at the college in all of our courses. And we're, um, we're making some modifications for fall. And so if you were to look at our syllabus template, the very, very top has our logo and immediately under that in larger, bold, yellow box, uh, all students must wear a mask and um, faculty have that autonomy to not allow a student to come into the class if they don't have a mask on um, and to ask a student to leave if they take off their mask. And we're working on some classroom behavior training for our um, faculty development activities that occur right before our semester begins to talk about how do you have those conversations with students. Okay, very good. Uh Carrie, do you, uh, is there a mask mandate at your school that you know about? I'm not sure. I don't know if professors can kick students out if they're not wearing masks. Mm -hmm. I hope they can, but I, I really don't know. And I'm one of the people who, like in theory, would have the problem with masks, not me wearing them, but other people wearing them because I am hard of hearing. And everything's muffled and harder to understand and can't lip read. And I've been in contact with our Office of Accessibility since uh, classes moved remotely in the spring. And they said they'll be distributing masks with like the clear uh, plastic to my professors in the fall. Okay, okay, so very good. All right, uh, Katie? Yep, we have quite a few questions. Um, I have. I'm gonna. I have. I'm gonna start with this one, and then I ha we have a good one about um, the the racial issues that might ha play out on campus. So I want to get to that one too. But let's let's focus on this one because it's in continuation with what Carrie was just talking about. Um, this um, participant says I have a plan to live stream my classes on Zoom and record them for students who don't feel comfortable in class. Do you think this will help my students who, like you, are uncomfortable in class? Is there anything you can think of that would improve the experience for those students? I think that is great for students I, to have that option. And I know that sometimes I'll zone out for a couple of minutes during class or um, I'll miss something the professor says. So being able to go back and watch it would, would be helpful. In, a normal setting too. I think uh, captioning those videos is important to make sure they're accessible because YouTube auto captions are terrible. Do not rely on YouTube auto captions if you actually want to understand something. Um, I think that's important and I think that is a great solution. Okay. Uh, way to go, Carrie. <laughs> Your Thank transparency you. is uh, what we need right now. Um, Katie, got something else for us? You wanted to ask the question uh, concerning race and e equity? Yeah, how are things, so the question is, how are things changing on your campuses given the rise in racial tensions this summer? Dr. Lynch, why don't you start us off with that? So 
uh, we are working on programming related to social injustice, uh, related to racism, just to have open dialogue uh, amongst all campus constituents. We've had several throughout the summer, both for faculty, staff, and then uh, separately for students. We've got a special topics course that we're offering in the fall for students specifically on the topic of social injustice and racism. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a director of diversity initiatives uh, who um, he and I are working together to put that to, to put that course together. And then we're going to continue to have uh, just more programming and more opportunities for students, faculty, staff to speak up and share um, you know, wh what they're feeling, how they're reacting, just to make sure that everyone feels safe, not just safe from the um, coronavirus and the pandemic, but safe from, uh, from a uh, social injustice perspective. Okay, Dr. Uh, Tindo? Um, well, regarding uh, the calls for change and Black Lives Matter and anti-racism and, and trying to put that into greater conversation in society. Um, several colleagues um, and I signed a, wrote an open letter to our university administration regarding the need for anti-racist pedagogy and education, as well as talking about some of the racial injustices that have happened in the past and currently on campus, dealing with that minority faculty issues and other things like that. That has prompted the university to have a diversity and inclusion and equity committee established, um, which I'm co-chair of no surprise, but, um, and that has, is working towards addressing some of those issues. On the faculty side, we are um, putting more classes that deal with diversity into our core. At our university, students do not have to take a diversity class inside of the core or a class that deals with diverse multicultural issues. So we're trying to remedy that. Also, we are doing a racial um, racial justice climate survey um, on campus as well, just to see how students react. Um, we, I, we are a majority minority campus. Um, and that is one thing that has come about is really trying to understand what is the experience of students of color. And for us, this didn't just spark because of what happened with the George Floyd incidents and Ahmaud Arbery and all the other, Breonna Taylor, all those incidents. This came up in the fall because of a racialized incident. So there's been a, there's been a, a, a slow burn um, and now it's fully ignited and now they're starting to be questions, demands. Um, people are really starting to think about what does this mean for the university? What does this look like? So again, change is coming, but it might be slow um, and it might be not exactly what people want because universities move at a glacial pace, but there are some things happening. Okay. And also we're in the middle of a pandemic, uh, <laughs> which might uh, uh, slow some things. Uh, Carrie, is there any, anything on your campus or anything uh, dealing with equity, uh, any changes that you're noticing and how things are being done? So um, in my, I go to a very white school. I like the first semester freshman year, I was kind of shocked at how white it was. There, my like whole hall in my dorm was all white or white passing people and that was kind of shocking to me and unfortunately it's kind of normalized there. We have to um, take a diversity intensive class which I've taken a couple of them just because they're interesting and they're in my major and minor like uh, sociology of race, uh, women of color and feminism um, and more classes like that but um, I've seen students um, camp like campaigning on social media to make the administration more aware of racism on campus and uh, to have more resources for students of color. Okay, okay. Uh, very good. Uh, do we have a, another uh, question, Katie? We do. So we have a lot of questions. Um, I'm trying to see how I can kind of put them together about this issue of um, how do faculty members um, address students who don't want to wear masks? <laughs> um, so I can see that um, a professor from North Carolina State University posted their policy. Um, so thank you for that. Um, let me let me read you a couple of these questions, and then I'll, Monica, I'll let you um, 
parcel them out as you see fit. So regarding the symptomatic nature of COVID, how will taking temperatures be sufficient to protect students and staff adequately? If many people aren't self-disclosing if they are sick, if students come to a lecture coughing and sneezing and refusing to wear masks, how will those issues be resolved without turning our campuses into police states? Some professors and students may opt to cancel classes if these issues occur. How should we be thinking these scenarios through? Um, it says this is a majorly, a majorly divisive issue now. Some students and staff may and probably will go off about wearing masks. Professors shouldn't have to deal with this added stress. So, um, so, how, so if you wanna delve into that a little bit, Monica. I, I think it's a it's an area that everybody who who may be going uh, on campus face to face is concerned with, and whether there is a mask mandate or not, and also the security of oneself and one's students if you attempt to make um, you know your voice heard about your frustration and someone not wearing a mask. And I think we've seen that in uh, some of our. Uh, things going on across the country where people are, you know, it is very decisive. I think Dr. Lynch said, we'll start with her because there is a mandate you mentioned. And you said there was gonna be some type of training uh, in reference to, can you talk to us a little bit more about it? Yeah, so every campus has a very different culture. And, uh, you know, as, as we've seen just amongst the, the panelists here, not every campus um, has the same policies that they can enforce. However, I would encourage everyone to reach out to your offices of academic affairs or faculty development centers for teaching and learning uh, to um, ask for programming related to classroom behavior management ask for meetings to have open discussions of how to issue how to handle this issue in fall so that way you can come up with a plan and a strategy that fits with your campus culture okay and you need to do that in advance don't we dr lynch we should be doing that now yes okay. absolutely yeah we're, we're pretty close to the start of fall semester for for many of us um, dr tindo uh, since you don't have a, a mandate what's what are you thinking what do you, you know? Um, I told my faculty that their health and well-being is the prior, first priority for myself and for and for and it should be for them. Um, if they don't feel comfortable being in a classroom with that, it, where this issue may come up, I said you need to move. You need to move your class online. And I think because the way hybrid is set up here, we can do almost seventy over seventy-five percent online. I, I'm absolutely fine with them doing that. Um, and again, too, I think, again, going to the CTL, our, our Center for Teaching and Learning Enhancement, going to those places and asking for issues on how to deal with these issues in terms of classroom behavior, classroom management would be helpful. However, I think this has become such a politicized issue that people are not, the normal responses that we would have in a classroom to bad behavior, untoward behavior, aren't going to work in these circumstances. That doesn't mean I don't think that we shouldn't talk about this, but I know here locally and, 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 and in the South, well, you're in the South as well, Laura, and everybody's here on the panels in the South, but definitely it, it's become a very, very politicized, dangerous issue to even engage with people because people will fight back. And so um, I'm not exactly sure what we can do and I think the safest option for most people is just to move your classes online and to until the cases shrink, until we have managed to reduce the incidence of it, just don't engage in that by in that one way of doing that is by having classes online. And I, that, that's my, that's my perspective. I don't know if my university agrees with me or not. I doubt they will, but that's my perspective. Well, I think what's interesting is that there's no clear cut answer. And I think that's what the issue is. Uh, and that's what our, uh, our attendees are, are asking. There's really no answer. And there isn't a lot of information being given about what to do if this comes up. And so I think reaching out now, asking, asking your Office of uh, Academic Affairs, please, what, what do we do in this case? At least you'll have your own and your faculty will have a scenario uh, to work with. 
Um, Katie, we have anything else? Got another question? Oh, we got quite a few. So I'm gonna again, try and throw some together. So um, uh, we had a couple of questions about student provided or institution provided transportation. So um, does your um, institutions have any policies for how to um, enforce social distancing on school provided transportation? Um, I, I have, sorry. There was another question. Oh, there's so many. Um, I'm trying hard to incorporate everyone's. Um, and I guess along with this sort of continuing on, how can they make this topic of mask non-political, particularly if you're in a specifically um, conservative area? And how do we faculty preserve confidentiality for students who are sick, either COVID or have allergies that might look like COVID? Oh, okay. Uh, you have an allergy and you sneeze in the store. Uh, that's uh, that's dangerous for you. Um, right. That's a that's interesting. Uh, either of uh, Dr. Lynch or Dr. Tyndall, uh, you have transportation at your uh, at your campuses, or do you, can you want to take a stab at talking about not making wearing masks uh, and the safety of our students and our faculty and staff on campus is more important and not and how not to politicize it. Anyone want to take a stab? We, we don't have uh, transportation at our institution. We're small, so easy, okay. easy to answer that, but it's not a helpful answer. I apologize. Uh, um, in, in terms of making the mask non-political, I would, I would go back to my suggestion of talking to your departments, talking to your offices of academic affairs, um, to have those open discussions about how to handle the mask situation in the classroom. Um, I think that again goes back to the culture of campus. Uh, politics absolutely has been playing in for it, even though mask wearing shouldn't necessarily be a political issue. Um, but having those open discussions and, and brainstorming as, as a faculty, as a department, um, it, that, that's, that's where you can uh, at least find some common ground and get some ideas from colleagues. Um, we hope, we would hope so, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, Dr. Tenda? Um, I think that there have been some professors who've been doing science experiments to show the effectiveness of wearing a mask, wearing a shield, not wearing a mask, those types of things when students are confronted with that, if that actually does help to some extent. Um, I think too, um, a lot of universities are engaging in like these photo campaigns to say, I wear a mask, um, you should wear, I mean, I wear a mask for these reasons. We're doing one in my department first, um, just because I wanted to do one, but we're doing one um, just to show people that everyone has a different reason for wearing a mask, but we're all doing this so we can help each other out. Um, I think trying to build that level of cooperation and community and, and support is something that we that needs to be done. Uh, also, too, I think one thing that we need to do is we need to really ask students what it, why is this politicized. So, doing some type of focus groups or surveys and asking them what would be your take on this, how what else would you address this? Um, and I don't know if everybody's seen this, but a UConn a professor at the University of Connecticut did a whole. Um, series of focus groups with students that really showed that students were not going to follow the distancing procedures, we're not going to do different types of things, we're not going to report themselves as having COVID um, because of the stigma attached with COVID. So there's a lot of things that came out of that report that you can ask your own students or even ask your faculty that could help to address some of the issues in terms of the politic politicization and also the stigma of COVID too, politicization of masks and the stigma of COVID. Um, Katie, uh, excuse me, uh, Carrie, uh, wearing a mask, uh, uh, why, why is everybody politicizing wearing a mask? What do you because think? Because people are trying to make a stupid point. Uh, I go to a school in a pretty liberal area, so I don't think it'll be a huge issue, but a lot of people are young and they think that that means they're immune and they're going to survive and people close to them won't die and uh, that's an issue. And going back to the transportation thing, we have two shuttles uh, on my campus. One goes from, they both go to different apartment complexes 
and um, the, one of them goes to my apartment complex, and it's almost always full when I'm going to class. And um, freshmen aren't allowed to have cars on my campus, so and parking classes are also like two hundred dollars. So and a lot. So that's a lot of money for a lot of people. And how if school gets moved all online and they pay two hundred dollars for a parking pass, that's uh, that's like lighting your money on fire. But um, freshmen aren't allowed to have cars, so they have no choice but to take the shuttles or public transportation, exposing themselves. Okay. A lot of uh, unanswered questions as we move closer uh, to our uh, to the opening of, of the fall 2020 um, semesters or quarters. A lot of unanswered questions having to do with how we're handling COVID um, and, and how to keep our students safe. Uh, Katie? Yeah, thanks, Monica. So um, I notice our time is getting close. So I'm going to try and again, um, put some questions together. We've had some really great questions. So I want to thank everybody who's um, submitted them and apologize if I haven't quite Manage to get your question asked. So, um, so one of the questions, and and it came up a couple of times, is how do you feel about student services like advising, tutoring, career services? Should they be offered um, virtually? Um, and I know sort of telehealth counseling. Um, they somebody suggests that students haven't used it, um, and now all counseling will be by a video conference at their institution. You know, so so what are we doing in terms of mental health, and um, should it be face to face or should it be done via um, technology? Okay. Dr. Lynch, uh, both of our mental health services are student uh, support services, like advising, career advising, tutoring. Those, all of those services are available, will be available in the fall for face to face and online telephone um, appointments. For face-to-face, -face, those offices are getting plexiglass shields that go on office, um, on desks. So that way there is a barrier between the staff member and the student. Okay, uh, Dr. Tindo? Um, there was a recent article, I think, in the Washington Post that talked about campus health centers and the fact that some of them are going to be very, are underprepared and going to be overwhelmed. Um, I know that our health center, they, they're making precautions to do face-to-face -face as well as telemedicine. So they're doing both with face-to-face -face with plexiglass and things like that. But I also think having the ability to connect students with off-campus resources as well is very important. And we maintain a list in our department of off-campus resources that they can go to for therapy, especially if students of color wish to see a therapist of color, they need to go off campus. So we have information that we maintain personally for that. Also, um, we, in my department, we have a junior senior advisor. He has done virtual um, advising for the past three or four semesters if the students requested it. So depending on the student body and who the students are and what they need, I, I think you have to know who your students are before you start making recommendations on these things. I have students, again, who live in Houston and commute to school. They commute maybe an hour to two hours a day to come to school. So for them just to come to campus to get you know, advise for an hour, go to the career center for an hour, that really doesn't make sense. So for us, it makes, it's the best decision. And it's because we know who our students are, we decide to make those decisions to do it that way. And, and but it, I hear from both you and Dr. Lynch that student services are making uh, inroads to being available for however you do your classes, you will have student service, you know, options available for those students. Okay, uh, right. Uh, uh, Carrie, what about student services? You're going to get get what you need. You think this uh, this upcoming semester? I sure hope so. Okay. Um, I've you I've never actually had to utilize our health center before, mm -hmm. but I think they should be sending out emails at at the beginning of the semester and like maybe a couple of weeks into the semester to remind people of the services they offer and um, make, 
and like advertise their therapy services even if they do get booked pretty fast I think students need to be aware of that and um, one thing I'm concerned about that I haven't uh, heard many people mention is transgender students who especially transgender freshmen who are um, leaving home for the first time and are finally going to be able to start seeking hormones and other um, things to help them medically transition. If they, have to, if they get kicked out of the dorms and have to go home, that's not going to be safe, especially if they're um, starting to pass as um, the gender they should be. They should have been assigned at first. Um, I think that we need to make sure transgender students and disabled students are taken care of. Okay. And the University of North Carolina Asheville needs to put uh, uh, Carrie on a committee uh, so they can get some of these things done uh, because you're absolutely right, sending out uh, communication, letting uh, our students know what's available uh, to them as they make uh, the opportunity to move back to school or, or go back into their classes. They need to have those services. So you need to be contacted and contacted soon. Uh, do we I'm have- I'm available for hire. Okay. I'm graduating in May. Someone please hire me. Okay. And, and that's another one, hopefully, that they'll take care of online is career services. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, Katie, you got another question? I think the last one, maybe. So um, we had quite a few comments, um, and so I'm going to make these comments into a question um, about faculty who maybe ha are being told that they have to teach online when maybe that's, or they have to teach face-to-face -face when maybe that's not their preference or what their belief is. So how would you suggest faculty address this? Wow. Uh, Dr. Chendo, you mentioned uh, you, you have some options for your faculty. Um, I think, um, I guess you take a multi-pronged approach. Um, the faculty should talk with their chair or their program head, I guess, to discuss their concerns. Um, that's one way of going about it. I also think that using the faculty senate, if your university has one or some type of faculty um, governance structure would be another way to discuss that. Also to, um, I don't tell faculty, I guess this is me as an administrator who's, who is still teaching. I don't go into my faculty's classroom and dictate how they deliver face to face. I don't dictate how they do anything in their classrooms during a regular semester. So how can I dictate now? I think you have to make the best choices for yourself. So I, I really think that there are the appropriate avenues. And if there is that type of blowback or the hard line that we have to be online, we have, I mean, we have to be face to face, then I think the faculty member can take initiatives inside their classroom. And so you say on Tuesday, this is a flip learning day. We are not meeting on Thursday. You will be doing this and or splitting up the class and saying that you all will meet on Tuesday. The, uh, the class that, that doesn't meet on Tuesday, you do something online, then you come to class on Thursday. I, I, I think there are creative ways to do workarounds. Um, and I, I believe that there are, I believe that there are creative ways that we as academics can get around this if you feel that there is not the support you need or the ability, or you do not have the ability to be face to face, use a workaround. If you're not getting the answers that you need from administration, work around it. Okay. Find a way or make one. I think that's that's the motto that I always use. Find a way or make one. Okay. Academics are good at that. Faculty are really good at that. Uh, Dr. Lynch. Yeah. Just just to piggyback off of what she said of uh, what Dr. Tyndall said. Figure out exactly where that hard line is. You know, see see what amount of wiggle room you have. You have to teach face to face, but do you have to teach 100% face to face? Can all of your classes be hybrid? What does hybrid mean at your institution? Does it have to be 50-50, or can you meet once a month? Can you meet, um, you know, 25% uh, of your class um, face to face and the rest online? And then and then just try to get creative 
um, with wherever that is that you do have to be face to face? Does it need to be in the classroom? Can one of those days be maybe be going to the library for for you know depending on what your course is, um, you know to, for some sort of experiential. Um, activity where students can space out quite a bit more uh, and you know if social distancing is a concern so just just really figuring out where those lines are that and and see how much room you have to to play around with that okay kind of like a workaround very good uh carrie you got anything to add before we finish up today what do you want to say um Make sure you're thinking about your disabled students, reaching out to your students before the semester starts, more so than normal, uh, and try to assure them if they, about their concerns or accommodations. Okay. All right. Uh, this has been uh, amazing. I want to thank all my guests. Uh, we're we've come back and we've come back to a wonderful panel with amazing information and sharing of ideas. So I want to thank Dr. Lynch, Dr. Tindo, and uh, Carrie uh, for enlightening all of us. Uh, we are moving, uh, we are not weekly anymore. We're every uh, other Wednesday, every second Wednesday, Katie, or every third, every we're on every other week. We're, uh, we're the first and third Wednesdays of the month. It's okay. changed a few times. So our okay. next one. <laughs> so we'll see you uh, in August. And, and we are working really hard to have a couple of uh, forms specifically focusing just on the students. So some of the students that you've seen already, we may have back. Uh, to talk about uh, moving in uh, to the, the next semester. So thank you for coming back and joining us. We've had an amazing time. Thank our guests. Thank, uh, thank you, Katie and Robin, Ethan. And we will see you, uh, I believe it's August 5th. Yep. Take care, everybody. See you later. Thank you.